you're on. Welcome. Welcome to another Ohio University Chillicothe remote event. This is hosted by the OUC Cultural Committee. My name is Deborah Nichols. I am the chair of that committee and I want to offer special thanks to all of those supporting our events this year. In celebration of Black History Month, we at OUC have collaborated with the Ross County uh, NAACP. With President An Andrea De Souza, we bring you this two-part series about the local history of and the links between art and social justice. We are happy to have these events facilitated by Mr. Vince Robinson. In our last talk, Mr. Robinson shared his memories of growing up in the Chillicothe area. He then focused on his journey to becoming an artist through education at Kent State. His growing experiences in the Cleveland artistic circles established him as a musician, a poet, photographer, and a radio program host. In his last presentation, Vince delighted us with a reading from his collection of poems, Got Words. Um, today, Mr. Robinson joins us again with a few colleagues and friends to provide a deeper dive, exploring those connections between art and social justice in black art communities. I will let him introduce his panel of speakers. Um, just a quick note on housekeeping, please feel free to use the YouTube chat feature for expressing uh, reactions and offering comments today. A short Q&A with the panel guests will follow um, at the Zoom link provided. So with that, thank you, uh, Mr. Robinson, for being with us today. And uh, thank you for sharing your guests with us. Thank you, Deborah. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I had such an enjoyable time at the last few hours that we spent together, and I'm really excited about what's going to happen today. Uh, we are going to talk about the intersection between history and social justice as it relates to art. And it's interesting, before we started this broadcast, I was having conversation with my colleagues and I realized that we all have something in common and that's Kent State University. Uh, one of the uh, panelists is someone who actually introduced me to my being a poet and I haven't looked back since. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of wonderful things together and I'm really privileged to have worked with all three of these distinguished artists. Each of them in their own right as a body of work that is unparalleled in, in our uh, Cleveland uh, artistic history. So uh, I want to introduce to you these three colleagues. They are Dr. Mary E. Weems, they are Terrence Spivey and Mwatabu S. Okanta. Uh, Dr. Mary Weems is a poet, playwright, author, imagination, intellect theorist, and cultural foundation scholar. She earned her BA and MA from Cleveland State University and her PhD in education from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She's the author of 13 books, including Black Eyed Plays and Monologues, Writings of Healings and Resistance, Empathy and the Imagination Intellect, Public Education and the Imagination Intellect. I Speak from the Wound in My Month, or My Mouth, uh, five chat books and numerous poems, articles, and book chapters. In 2015, she was awarded a Cleveland Arts Prize for her full length drama, Meet. In both of her books of poems, An Unmistakable Shade of Red and The Obama Chronicles, which was uh, published by the Bottom Dog Press in 2008, and Foreclosure, Main Street Rag. They were finalists for the Ohio Anna Book Award. She's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and her 14th book, Still Hanging, using performance texts to Deconstruct Racism, which he co-authored with Dr. Brian Alexander. It's, a forthcoming, it's forthcoming from Brillson's Press in the spring of 2021. Mwatabu S. Okanta holds the BA in English and African Studies from Kent State University in 1976 and the MA in Creating Writing from the uh, City College of New York in 1982. An associate professor in the Department of Pan-African Studies at Kent State University, where he is now serving 
as the assistant chair. He also serves as the director of the, Ga the uh, Ghana Study Abroad Program, and he's taught at the Livingston College of Rutgers University and Cleveland State University. He's the author of several books, including Africa Brass, Collage, Legacy for Martin and Malcolm, Sheikh Ante Joe, Poem for the Living, published as a limited trilingual edition in English, French, and Wolof, uh, Reconnecting Memories, Dreams No Longer Deferred, Muntu Kuntu Energy, New and Selected Poetry 2013, uh, Gorilla Dread, Poetry for Hearts and Minds, and his work has been anthologized in the company of Russell Atkins in 2015, Cleveland Poetry Scenes, a Panorama and Anthology in 2008, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks and Working Writers, Beyond the Frontier, African American Poetry for the 21st Century and Elsewhere. I gotta shorten these because there's so much <laughs> that I could share, but I'm gonna move on to uh, Terrence Five. He is an artistic director born in Kuntz, Texas. And uh, he joined Kent State University's theater and dance department as an adjunct professor in 2008, becoming a theater director in residence for production by Kent State University's Pan-African Studies Department in 2013. He was selected as a keynote speaker for the United States Institute for Theater Technology's 55th Annual Conference in 2015. In 2016, he left Caramu House and began working as a freelance director, acting instructor, theater lecturer and career consultant and speech coach. And I'll add to that, that he also embarked upon doing his very first film. So with all of that said, I wanna uh, welcome all these amazing people into the room today and greet you um, again. I'm just so honored to, to share this time with you and to hear the things that you are going to share with us. So uh, when we embarked upon this journey, I thought it would be key for everyone's voice in terms of their art to be heard. So I'm going to invite everyone to share uh, a piece of your work with us just so that the audience could get a taste of your revolutionary product. And since Dr. Mary Weems is the lady, and I believe in letting the ladies go first, I'm going to invite <laughs> Dr. Weems into the room and I invite her to share some of her work as well as any opening comments that she would like to make. I just want to say that Brother Okanta is somebody I not only respect and love, but he and I have been on this journey of presenting, to, presenting our poetry together for a very long time. It's always good to see you. Terrence, you directed one of my most important plays, Closure, about the foreclosure crisis at Karamu House in 2011. It was an unforgettable experience. I love you, brother. It's good to see you. Me too. The piece I would like to share is a poetic monologue, and I wrote it after Dr. Bryant Alexander, my colleague who I co-wrote Still Hanging with, sent me a news report pointing out that on May the 14th of 2018, the local CBS 40, um, Channel 46 news station shared that a black woman was found attached to a tree in the parking lot of Walmart. In this piece, I try to step inside her and write what that felt like. It's called Attached. When you dead, you can hear and smell everything. The still air, slight scent of old peaches and magnolias, sound of the click made thousands of miles away to find the CBS news report about where I was found, unknown and unidentified. I'd stopped at Walmart after a long day at work, needed some almond milk and pork rinds, grabbed a six pack of soda last minute, just in case we'd run out at home. While I was standing in line, I noticed three white men wearing MAGA hats, not looking at me the way white folks do when they pretending like they haven't attached their gaze to you like Gorilla Glue. Made me nervous, but I thought, Walmart's got cameras everywhere. Plus, I've been working out, so if I need to run, 
I can. Cashier handed me my debit card, noted I was almost down to my last $10. I've been through her line a thousand times, so didn't mind. Thanked her, looked around, no MAGA hats, started breathing. Relieved, I stepped outside to walk to my car. I almost made it. Scanned the close to dark lot before I opened the front door, put my purse on the driver's seat, turned to open the back and three mega hats popped up like the three stooges at the beginning of a movie. One put his hand over my mouth, the other grabbed me around the waist, the third snatched my feet off the ground. I tried to fight, but they had me trapped like a hog about to be slaughtered. I could smell the almost summer breeze. It felt warm and welcoming, like I was getting ready to sit down in my yard for some sweet tea. Instead, they took me to the way in the back east end of the lot where a stand of trees lined the fence, put a knotted rope around my neck, called me a nigger bitch, tied the other end to a thick branch and dropped me. Dead people can't tell time, but it felt like a while before two white police officers approached with their guns drawn, like I was in front of them, standing on ground, alive and dangerous. I hear them talking. Well, I'll be damned, Jim, not another one. You're over me. What will we report on this one? Shit, I don't know, Hunter. With all this shit already going on down here, we can't say lynched. Hell, we can't even say rope. You got that right, so what do we say? Whatever it is, I'm with you. Okay, how about this? Unidentified black female found at 8.03 p.m. in the east end of the Southfield Walmart. She appears to be dead and is attached to a tree. What you think, Hunter? Sounds okie dokie to me, sir. Let's call the body bag people and get the hell out of here. Time for dinner. Amazing. You know, one of the things that I like about your work, uh, Mary, is that it, it always gives you a certain sense of, of authentic experience. It's like you're sitting there as an observer at, at, to whatever you're describing. Uh, the plays have been wonderful. I, I'm recalling the uh, the piece that you did at Larchmere Arts, you know, and how real it was to the folks that were there. As you were doing your presentation, there were actually tears flowing in the room. And, you know, that's just a testimony of your ability to reach folks. So thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our brother Okanta. Since we have two folks who are in the theater world, we're going to go to the poet now. So brother Okanta. Wow, I, I should be used to following my sister poet. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Poetry is how we see. Poetry is how we be. I want to do a piece called Cruelty. This was inspired by a drawing called Cruelty uh, from an artist called John Carlson. Hands up, don't shoot. A new call from a new generation. I can't breathe in this country. Black lives have never really mattered. American history is what it is. From slave auctions to Black Wall Street, from East St. Louis to Ferguson, from Jasper to San Juan, broken lives and recycled lies. Why? Things change while things stay the same. Toxic fear is the menace that is never far away. It festers up close, personal, it imprisons our minds, have to wake up to stay woke. Spiritual sickness is the real dis-ease. 
no compassion, no joy, no soul, no love. Cruelty is as cruelty does. Mm. Cruelty is alive. Cruelty is old. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another very powerful piece. You know, you yes, are, yes. have inspired me to write a lot of poems over the years and just reflecting as I do uh, often about the time that we spent together. And I've told this story many times, but I just remember being a student in your class and you using that word that resonated with me. And the word was implications. <laughs> and, you, and you had me reading and, and newspapers and Newsweek magazine and U.S. News and World Report and watching Face the Nation and Meet the Press and all those other shows that I never really had an interest in. So I thank you for waking me up. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on to our brother Terrence. And I, I apologize, Terrence, because there was so much in your bio that I couldn't get to. But I think where I <laughs> left off is in your last accomplishment. It's a film that is going to be screening in several yes. festivals this year. So let's bring you into the room. And, you know, I, I had a quandary about what to ask you to do because, you know, I, I know you write, I know you direct, I know you do all yes. those things, but I, I just thought yes. I'd give you a few moments to talk about something that's relevant and meaningful to you from your body of work. Thank you. Thank, well, first of all, it's an honor, Dr. Akantu, Dr. Wings. Mary, I think Closure was your first play, wasn't it? We it, did it at it, 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 uh, it Caramel. First play. first play I had produced at Caramel, yes. Very first play with Diane McIntyre, yes. Yes, so uh -huh. we put up. Um, but it's an honor to be up here on the panel with you all. And of course, Vince, uh, I'm glad that you asked me to just talk about the most recent project I'm working on because I can't, I couldn't follow any poets right now. I'm gonna be, you know. <laughs> so, uh, um, yes, um, I am very excited. Uh, I, a piece that that compelled me to uh, after the George Floyd incident, a uh, piece called "Resurrection of the Last Black Man" in zero eight four six. And it's based on a 1933 tragic hanging and burning of David Gregory in my hometown, Coons, Texas. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, last year, November, December, it hit two film festivals. It's a, it's a film short. And uh, it got best uh, honorable mention, best sound, uh, best music. I use Mahalia Jackson music and, and to underscore the, the film. And just now running now as until the 21st, it's now running virtually at the San Francisco Indie Fest right now in the uh, short film category. And also at the prestigious Toronto Black Film Festival. All right, it's all running right. running there at the moment. And I was so excited to see the, the wonderful promo trailer that uh, Toronto did. And I saw the film popped up, pop up between all the other uh, scenes of other, sh other films. And I was like so excited. Um, as of two days ago, I just got um, news that it's also part of the Con Film Festival, uh, Short Film Fest mm -hmm. they have, mm -hmm. and that's going to be in March. All right. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm excited more so because it's different. It's not moving pictures. Uh, Jennifer Hearn, um, a photographer I met at Short Coaches Center two years ago when I was associate director, um, we got together and put the piece together. And she said, I can't edit moving pictures. She said, Tara, so you know about the French film La Jete? I said, yes, I'm very aware of the 1960 film. It's done, it's a, a 20 minute film done through images. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to go that direction, use historical images, uh, historical, past, present. And we're using Michael, oh, Michael May, as some of y'all know Michael May, Mm -hmm. uh, I've directed work. I was about to say Michael Oldman. No, no. <laughs> I should have <laughs> <very> heard that. <laughs> uh, but wonderful playwright, wonderful playwright. But the wonderful actor Michael May, who I worked with at Caramel, he he's narrating. I don't even want to say narration. It's a monologue. Mm -hmm. He's monologuing through the eyes of David Gregory on what happened to him in 1933, on why he got burned and how he uh, took his heart out and and nailed it to a tree and. And, and crowd his genitals and that kind of thing. So, um, and also three other actress, actresses in it, well, two at one actor, uh, Janine Gaskin, 
She's the voice of the mother of David Gregory and Sharon Fox mm -hmm. is the imagery of the mother mm -hmm. and a young uh, uh, Carter Miller, who's uh, Sharon Fox's uh, 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 great nephew. Mm -hmm. He plays young David Gregory. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very excited. Uh, we're looking for some further development of, of, of maybe a, a full length documentary in the future. And I'm looking to go to my hometown, Coons, and, uh, and do some more research. Okay, so this work that you've done describes something that happened years ago. And uh, the context of our conversation today has to deal with history. So obviously you're dealing some, with something that's historical. Uh, Mary, yes. you went back and you dealt with something that was historical to you or something that you re related to historically. Uh, what I'd like to get to, first of all, is where those two things meet, history, art, and social justice, because there's a theme that, 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 that is woven through all the things that we talk about, you know. And as I sit here during Black History Month and just reflect on the roles that we have played as artists, you know, Brother Oconta mentioned it last week when we did a program uh, for a, a group of folks who are into uh, literacy in Akron. He was talking about the role of the griot. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that really resonated with me, especially when he got to the point of making that the griot was the one who was spared when war came. So there had to be a value to the story yeah, being true. told. Mm -hmm. And that's... That's who tells the story. We tell the story. So each of you, uh, if you could just take a few moments to talk about that intersection between art, uh, history, and social justice. Well, mm -hmm. it's every to me, it's a everything is is connected. It's like being on a spiritual continuum. So that the lynching of a black person in 2018 is directly connected to the lynching of a black person in the 18, in the 1900s, directly connected to the lynching of a black person during slavery. Social justice, if you're an oppressed enslaved people, social justice is a, is a constant part of your life and of your history. Anytime I write, I'm never writing as an individual. I'm always, it's a spiritual process. I'm always open to and channeling black folk who come before me, those I know and those I've never known. So much so that a lot of times when I'm through writing something and go back and read a piece, I ask myself, who wrote that? Okay. Mm. I would say for yeah, me. That's, no, Go ahead, um, Dr. O'Connor. History is a living thing. It's it's alive. You know, many people think that history repeats itself. I don't think it repeats itself. I was taught uh, that history is always in the process of being made. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, I, I perceive myself as a storyteller. And, and my job is to not only keep that history alive, but to, to pass it forward. Um, when I listen to, to Mary's poem and I listen to Terrence describe his piece, it immediately brought to mind the Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem, The Haunted Oak. <laughs> you know, because Dunbar was writing about uh, a man who was lynched on a tree. Yes. But in a very African way, mm -hmm. the tree was alive mm -hmm. and the tree was aware of what was perpetrated on one of its branches mm -hmm. and, and the tree took offense and allowed that branch to die. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, as, as artists, it's, it's our job to tell these stories, keep them alive in whatever genre or medium 
that we are working in. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, I agree with both of what they said. I, I let me just also put in my bio, make sure in the bio, Vince, that I, I studied theater at a historical black college, mm -hmm. uh, Prairie View A&M mm -hmm. University at, at 45 miles out of Houston. It was actual plantation. So mm -hmm. it was cemented in our minds with my mentors to, to as Paul Robeson would say, uh, we are the gatekeepers of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, we are civilization's radical voices. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing we learned while we were in school. And that's why we learned to not only educate, uh, not just about entertaining, not just to inform, but to provoke. Mm -hmm. um, and I look back, I mean, before even the, the civil rights movement, I look back to, to, to uh, Williams Wells Brown, mm -hmm. uh, Escape Leap of Freedom, mm -hmm. which, which is which a romantic piece where he basically was writing about fugitive slaves marrying, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, you look at William Henry Brown, uh, who wrote this whole piece about the throwaway, um, uh, and that deals with the whole French, the whole French uh, uh, set, uh, settlers and uh, English settlers with the Caribbean or Caribbean uh, uh, war. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll go back to those, the canons like, like Dr. Okuntu said about remaining history and it's still alive. I'll go back to the days now of African growth theater. When you see the African co theater company, the first black theater company in the country, to do works that was reflecting Shakespeare, but they're also doing works that was reflecting their own. Mm -hmm. And moving up to uh, American Negro Theater, you know, mm -hmm. where Ruby D and Ozzie Davis and all of them did pieces that was beyond, right in the YMCA uh, basement in Harlem. And on top of that, folks don't know, Anna Lucasta talking about appropriation, which they weren't purposely appropriating. Anna Lucasta is a Polish play. Mm -hmm. But it was not successful. African Americans did the play and it became a big hit on Broadway, and of course, the film with Eartha Kitt and Sammy Davis Jr. So there's a lot of history back there with appropriation and social justice. And then we move up now to the whole thing of civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement got into the whole 1965 when Malcolm X, of course, was assassinated. Amir Baraka, you know, aka uh, 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 Leroy Jones. This man decided to leave the village and go uptown to Harlem and created the Black Arts Movement, which started reflecting on what was going on in society. So that mm -hmm. art intersecting, intersecting uh, social justice, he realized, and we realize now, a lot of people are suffering in, 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 in the silence. Mm -hmm. And that's what caused me to also, since I love Carol Move, to start, I find myself working more and doing pieces that still with social justice. I was mm -hmm. working with Ms. Samaria Rice she talked about why no one here is speaking out about Tamir. Mm -hmm. And by me doing that play, it was a catharsis to be able to do the work, which Mary Wings, by the way, one of her works was part of it too, to be able mm -hmm. to exercise and get that out the way and, 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 and allow people to have some kind of talk back and discussions to, to talk and say, hey, what did go down between the perception of who was wrong and who was right? So. Mm -hmm. This whole thing with, 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 let me just say that I was fortunate to be within the past three or four years, four of my mentors have passed. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago, C. Lee Turner was my biggest mentor at Prairie View, the prolific playwright Ted Shine, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Camille Billups, who you know was well respected in New York, and uh, a couple of others, uh, 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 James, James Hatch, who wrote books on black theater, they've all passed. Mm -hmm. So it's my job, because as Richard Morris, who I worked with at Caramel, he said that we always had to say, you know what? Art, particularly theater, is a hand-me-down job. Mm -hmm. It's who comes on, you pass it and pay it forward. And mm -hmm. I find myself now as a depository, individual depository, in all art forms as a depository. We need to find ways of keeping it preserved, particularly black theater history, which I'm a huge advocate of. We must mm -hmm. find ways to keep it preserved, particularly with the social justice, and make sure it's not lost. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to add something to the conversation. Yesterday, I watched Nina Simone's documentary, and yes. it reminded me of the price we pay for speaking out, for writing about, 
for putting our bodies on the line in order to say, no, this injustice, this racism, this violence is wrong. When Nina Simone wrote and sang the song, Mississippi Goddamn, which was about the lynching of black folk, Mississippi being the number one state in the country for lynching black people, she was blackballed here to the point that she had to leave in order to make a living and go to Europe. You know, we poets, she was white listed. Thank you. Yes. I stand yes. corrected. Yes. <laughs> but I, also, right. <laughs> I also discovered something I didn't know about her, which is that like my late daughter, she was bipolar. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think about how she stood up and said things that a lot of black folk were thinking, but afraid to say, and the price she paid. Mm -hmm. I wanna follow up and, and based on something that Terrence brought up as he was describing his work with Samari Rice and ask about, well, first of all, I, I like to ask about what woke you up? When did it happen for you when you decided that you had a voice that you could use to uh, instigate or to provoke change. And then I also want you to talk about the role of the artist beyond just telling the story. You know, we talked about the griot and the role of the griot, but when you have a talk back and you engage with an audience about what they saw, you know, it goes beyond just telling the story and it, it goes to having an impact on the lives of people who've just experienced what you created. So. Could you talk about when it was that you realized that you had a voice that could make a difference and talk about the role of the artist beyond just telling the story? Well, from the time I was a child, mama was always slapping me in the mouth. <laughs> it was usually because I was saying some shit. I had no business saying. But I wrote my first poem when I was 13. And I always, believed I had a voice. In terms of the social justice justice part, when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, I was just starting high school. And that's when the more radical part of me took off and I started writing work that really specifically spoke out against racism for justice. I was not on the peaceful side. I was more with Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. So I started reading more radical work, writing more radical work and opening my mouth in a more specific and organized way. Mm. My, my awakening, looking back on it, came in stages. Um, I didn't write when I was a child. But I remember I was 12 years old when Malcolm X was assassinated. And I lived in a blue collar, middle class neighborhood in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. My father was the only one on the street who would talk to the brothers that would come through the neighborhood selling the Muhammad Speaks. <laughs> and I just remember when news that Malcolm had been assassinated came across the television screen, I remember my father's silence. It, it was a loud silence. Because um, mm. my father was one of those black men. He was a World, World War II vet, part of the Red Ball Express. Mm. Uh, he never would have joined the Nation of Islam, but Malcolm was his man. Malcolm gave voice to what I now know he and other men and other people were feeling. Mm -hmm. Like Mary, I was in high school. I was 15 when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And at 15, I'm a little older uh, and more aware of what's going on. And that began to radicalize me, if we're going to use that term. Mm -hmm. uh, April 5th, 1968 was the first time I consciously refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I ran track. Uh, that's how I ended up at Kent State. Uh, 
you know, I was recruited by the track team. Mm -hmm. But in 1968, uh, that fall at the Mexico City Olympics, and that's what my hoodie is. Uh, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, and because I ran track, we knew who Tommy Smith was. We knew who John Carlos was. We knew that black athletes were considering boycotting the Olympics or staging some kind of protest over the admission of South Africa and Rhodesia to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. and, and so that further radicalized me. And then when I went off to Kent State in 1970, it would be at Kent State that I found my voice. Because it's interesting, you know, that same fall, 1968, I got an F in an English class because I refused to write poetry. <laughs> uh, and poetry for me at that time was alien. The stuff we were exposed to in school was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. And I just refused to do it. Mm -hmm. But when I was exposed to Langston Hughes, but even more than Langston Hughes, when I was exposed to the negritude poets, mm -hmm. Leon Damas, mm -hmm. Aimé Césaire, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Leopold Senghor, it just resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And and then by the time I heard the last poets, Gil mm -hmm. Scott Heron, Camille mm -hmm. Yarbrough, mm -hmm. Nikki Giovanni, I mean, it was just a whole new world. And I was able to discover that poetry was in me mm -hmm. and I found my voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Terrence? Yes. Yeah, mine is coming like a couple of stages. Mine started in cinema, mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not, before I even went to college. Uh, being in, living in Houston, uh, young teen in seventh grade at Hamilton uh, Junior High School. I had just seen the film, uh, Slaughter's a big ripoff with Jim Brown. Um, <laughs> and my mother, I've seen tons of the film. Well, Mary can tell you, we could sit and cheat, so she, no, I could sit and talk about films. Uh -huh. um, we, um, I had seen the film, and that was a mean, this mean, I'm going to say white teacher, was very mean in history class. And I had just seen the film that weekend, and that following Monday, I, I actually acted out Jim Brown on the top of the building. And this white guy rips his shirt off. He picks the guy up and throws him off the building. <laughs> um, so I acted it out. I mean, that's when I was realizing how and I'm an actor. I acted out to my buddies. And so we went into the history class. Uh, they speak with snickering. And they kept snickering. I laughed a bit. Out, and the teacher kept wondering, what are y'all laughing about? They kept looking over at me. And so we kept it quiet. Uh, you know, home room, sometimes you come back to what the third or fourth period. One of them was an informer and told him what they were snickering about. I ended up going to the principal's office. Mm. And he says, you know, I was expelled uh, <laughs> for, a couple of, for a couple of days because he said, I understand you were visualizing. You told these guys you were visualizing Jim Brown throwing me off the building and slow his big rip off. And that scared me to just scared me because I didn't know that thinking how powerful art is and film and cinema. But I realized, wow, OK, by me doing all this, like storytelling, a griot in a way. But uh, it caused these guys to go and tell this man what happened. Um, that got me going more like I have a voice here. It's kind of hilarious, but I have a voice here. Then went on to college. Uh, we did many a plays there, but Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope by Mickey Grant. Mm. It was on Broadway uh, with like 12 actors in the cast. We did the show uh, 19, early 80s at, at Pro Review in my school. We took it to competition reach, uh, area re in its regional American College Theater Festival. Then we ended up being invited 12 colleges, including ours, to take the show to the Kennedy Center. Took it to the Kennedy Center, and then it was a write-up before we got there. A big write-up saying 90% white audience coming to see this black play with 30 black students on the stage. Mm -hmm. Chanting, Czechoslovakia, boom it boom Yugoslavia, boom it boom <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
I'm like, whoa. <laughs> we had a standing ovation after intermission. I mean, I have, yeah, right before intermission at the after the last first act of the show. Standing ovations. Three performances, standing ovations. That's when it really hit me that I had a voice. Now the mm. last the last time it really hit me was a caramel. It was a youth theater play called Body and Soul, uh, written by this lady from Boston about human trafficking amongst teens. Mm -hmm. um, we had auditions. We felt like we need to get uh, maybe students from CSU or somewhere to play these parts. Monologues are very rough. Mm -hmm. And so we had road disclaimers and some of the, a lot of kids from uh, Cleveland School of Arts came and they said, we want to do this. And their parents said, they can do it. We told them the nature of the play. We did the play. Um, one of the students, so my talkbacks, one of the students. Now, mind you, we have done about two, uh, had about two seasons so far of plays and talkbacks. This is my third season. We decided to have a talkback for this play. One of the students in the play from CS, CSA, um, she was sitting in the, sitting down with, with, the, with the rest of her, her cast. And they started talking about human trafficking. And her mother stood up and she was crying. She said, my oldest sister was part of this. The minute she said that, I looked over to the young girl, lady, her mouth was like this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that told me that was the first time hearing this. Mm -hmm. In the rest of the cast, after, after the talk back was over, everybody in the audience, in the arena state, arena theater, 100 seat theater, everybody walked out. The mother went and hugged her daughter, the cast, and the people who came to see the show, it was a huge circle of hugging. Vince, Dr. Okantu, Dr. Wings, that really hit me in the youth and the innocence of that too hit me so much like whoa this is beyond me as a director it's beyond me as a theater this is a like a call for action uh when that's what hit me and i was thinking about all the time it took for me to understand what my mentor from Fergie was telling me you know but i have to provoke and to inform and in how we're important we're custodians of the arts and it's important as dr wing said putting yourself out there and I felt like I looked back not only for the Black Arts Movement, I also looked at the, the Free Southern Theater that was a, a three-year touring that went into the South and having tomatoes and bricks thrown at them, going to rural areas they couldn't that Blacks who couldn't afford to see plays. Mm -hmm. And by the way, one of the co-founders of the Free Southern Theater was uh, 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 Gilbert Moses, a Karamula. Who was also married to, to, to Denise Nicholas and Didi Bridgewater. But mm -hmm. just that there just, just hit me so much. So that's what got me going and taking chances and wanting to put certain plays up at Caramel was that body and soul. So I must continue to do my job. You know, it's not about ticket sales. It's not about you want to make money, but it's not about making money. It's about creating truth and reality on stage. And as Akira Kurosawa once said, as an artist, we should not avert ourselves from the truth. That's it. So that's what got me going there. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talked about that mother-daughter moment uh, during that, that play or the, during the talk back, it kind of made me think about the whole idea of essential versus non-essential. And one thing that I've always thought about, you know, particularly within the past a year or so, is the artist as an essential. Can you, could you talk about the artist as an essential worker, if you want to use that term, versus being devalued as being non-essential in, in today's landscape? Uh, well, that's interesting for me. You know, I, I often tell my students, and they kind of look at me when when I say this, that I am a poet disguised as a college professor. Mm. Mm. And, you know, mm. and I had to figure out, and I had help. 
uh, once I went into the tenure track, you know, because I go, mm-hmm. you know, I work at a research university. We have to do research. And so it forced me to write prose, to, to, to come out of poetry and write in another genre. Um, and oftentimes my subject matter mm-hmm. was writing about the need for artists in, in all of our uh, uh, modes that artists should also be at the table when we're talking about community development. Yes. When we're talking mm-hmm. about how are we going to reclaim our communities? How are we going to put these shattered lives back together? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so artists indeed are essential mm-hmm. because we can bring people together that don't even want to be together. That's right. Yes. Okay. And I remember doing a performance with the Cavani String Quartet. We were in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we do this piece for Martin Luther King. And this was stunning for me because when the quartet first, when I was first approached, it was like, are you guys really sure that you want me to do that <laughs> with you? You know, um, yeah. <laughs> because it's it's because I know the kind of work that I do, mm-hmm. and 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 they were insistent because most of the places where we perform, the audiences are predominantly white. Yes, and it was stunning for me because I'm looking at this audience responding to my poetry with these strings and people were in tears, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and here we were in Dixie. The first thing we saw coming into Wilmington was a a Confederate soldier monument, Mm. you know, and all I could say to the people was, "I'm, I'm glad you lost the war. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, because if you had lost the war, I couldn't be here like this today. Um, but it, it allowed me to see how our work can touch people, that our work can touch people that we didn't even think it could touch. Um, mm-hmm. And that's important. So artists are essential. And, and, and I think our work can help heal people because we've been wounded and we need healing. Mm-hmm. And I, I just want to yes. jump on that. It's a, it's a first, first and foremost, I'm a poet and I'm not a poet because I chose to be. Hey. Looks like we have a, a slight technical issue. Her, um, her her screen froze up, and I think it's probably only a few moments before she'll come back into the screen. But Just as we wait for her signal to be restored, um, Brother Terrence, did you have something that you wanted to add to that? It, yes, it, we are we are essential. I see, as I said before, we're depositories. We're uh, as a director, as an actor, uh, playwrights. Uh, we're literary archivist in a way, you know, we, now we don't have to worry about just museums and libraries where our work is archived in the clouds. And it's important for us to um, be able to uh, um, uh, do, as I said before, do the truth uh, and not sugarcoat anything because that's what we're, as a mentor of mine said, he always said, art is gonna be one of the saviors. Art is the savior. And as Dr. Okanta said, it's about healing, um, it's about reflection, it's about rejuvenation, it's about resurrection. Um, and definitely now regarding the whole pandemic, it's caused me to resurrect in a way and reflect on so many things. Um, and also caused me to be more selective and also to be, I mean, George Floyd is almost, he, he, the death of George Floyd, let me put it this way. The death of George Floyd reminded me, because everything now is being black, black, black. 
I always use the word black theater. When everybody else was, uh, people I know in the city was using African American. And ever since George Floyd and the Black Lives Movement and the Black Girl Magic, it's black, black, black. And I'm watching it on television now. Black this, black that the news. It's not this fear anymore of using black as such a powerful word, you know? And being essential uh, as an artist, we are, it is important for us to, you look back at Ozzy Davis and Ruby Dee. They were act, not just actors, but they were actor vest. And I see myself as a director vest uh, of actors doing what we do that's working with me now, or actor vest. So it is important that we're, we're very essential uh, to telling the stories because we're a literary archivist in a way. I want to open a can of worms. You know, I, I don't necessarily identify myself as a conspiracy theorist, but I do think about things that are going on. And yeah. as I look at the fact that, you know, they're saying, well, you can't come to church. They're saying you can't sit in a theater and, and have that theater experience. You can't go to the stadium and listen to a performing artist do what they do. Now you have to watch them on a screen or you know watch them in your living room instead of being there with them to feel their energy. I, just throw the I'm just throwing a question out there. Do you think that there was any intentionality in separating artists from their audiences? Hmm. You, well, let me. Uh, I don't know, but let me just say it this way is making it, it strengthen us a lot more. You know, we go find ways, like I say, art is, uh, is a savior. We go find ways to create. Well, it hasn't stopped me from going to the theaters. I go into the theater and see all these films, there are only five people sitting in there. So, but um, it's, ca it's caused, like I say, reflection and resurrection in a way. Um, I don't. It's strengthening, causing us to be a lot more creative, and we're coming out with a lot more substance. Uh, but I understand what you're saying. I mean, it, it's it's a toss up because I I know a lot of friends of mine talk about that too. But it's caused people to reflect a lot. You know, I, I hear what you're saying, and even before the pandemic, and and it depends on as artists what kind of art we're creating. Um, mm -hmm. I got two quotes. One is from Harriet Tubman. She said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more <laughs> if only they knew they were slaves. Mm -hmm. huh. Or this quote from Frederick Douglass, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Now we live in a society for those of us who are artists who are bringing those kinds of stories, they have a vested interest in either separating us from our audiences or as much as they can preventing our audiences from knowing, from knowing that we even exist. Okay, and you know, and the pandemic may compound that, but you know, if I understand part of what, what, what Terrence was saying, and I agree with it, because of the pandemic, we've found new ways to connect with our audiences. And I think when we, whenever we get back to the new normal, um, meeting our audiences in this forum, in this format is not going to change. I mean, you know, Vince and I, when we did our performances for uh, uh, Cleveland State's 50th anniversary of their cultural, their, their Kuumba Arts Festival or what we did for Kwanzaa, you know, our friends in Ghana were able to log on to that in real time. So we went from the only way we can get in front of an audience in Ghana live was to be there but now we were in front of an audience in Ghana through this medium so that, you know, something positive has come out of what other people might use to disconnect us. And, and so what I'm saying is, is out of their hand. It's like you said, you open a can of worms, it's out there now and they can't put the genie back in the bottle. 
Uh, Vince, let me just say quickly, well, because um, there's no way you can. Yeah, there's no way they can. It can. We're, we, our work, whether it's dancing, visual arts, drumming, uh, acting, whatever. That's ba our profession is based on reflecting reality. So we go find many ways. I'm gonna use the analogy of the movie The Blob. I went back. I didn't see it back then when I was a kid, but I'm okay. the analogy of the Blob. The blob go find ways to leak under the doors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's gonna find ways to creep up, up in the ceiling. So we're artists. We gonna find ways to creep out somewhere and reflect what's going on. So we're like that. What's that Jello pudding? Whatever that. What is that? That um, little shapes with <laughs> it's, it's kids. What is that? Like, what movie you not, not, not the, not the a slinky. What is that? Oh. That um, putty. Anybody remember? Maybe I'm oh, talking about my age now. Silly putty. Silly putty. Silly putty. Yeah. We're yeah, silly yeah, putty. Yeah. We go, no matter how you shape it, we're going to come out some kind of way and still say, hey, you cannot put us down. We're going to find ways to reflect mm -hmm. and show you the good and the bad and what you all are doing to us. <laughs> so can I, now that I'm back, sorry folks, can I get back to what I was trying to say? Yes. <laughs> which was that I think, yeah. I think some of us are born artists and whatever, and many of us discover it, some don't, whatever medium we're intended to work in, we're driven to do it. So I don't write poetry and I didn't start writing poetry because it was a choice. I started writing poetry because that's how I see the world. In my particular case, I wrote to get to know myself, to get to feel better about myself, in addition to documenting what I saw through my own perspective. I think that there's a double healing in creating art. When we create, it helps heal us and it helps heal anybody who's open to what we're sharing. Mm -hmm. And so if if only one thing can be said about me when I take my last breath on this world in this world to describe mm -hmm. me, say that I was a poet. OK, while you were gone, we were talking about uh, the possibility that there was intentionality in separating artists from their audiences. And what Brother Terrence and Brother Watabu brought into the conversation was what it did was it resulted in us making lemonade from the lemons that we've been given and finding new ways to connect with our audiences. But I want to ask you the question as well. Uh, do you think that there was any intentionality in that separation that has taken place because of the pandemic that we're navigating through? Oh, without question. And, and always. I mean, I think about Basquiat and how during his time, it was Warhol and the white boys that were popular. He was doing this amazing work, but at that time, the art critics determined whether or not your shit was good. If they said it was good, you can make money. If they didn't, you couldn't. So while Basquiat, who painted almost constantly, was taking um, help from well, to do white folk who would allow him to stay in their homes while he painted and then accept his work as rent. Warhol was becoming famous and getting paid and making all kind of money for, you know, Campbell soup cans. So mm -hmm. I think fast forward to the pandemic, the last thing the powerful want to see is folk like us creating work that expresses what's happening to black folk during the pandemic. That's not what they want to see. And yes, there is an effort to intentionally stop us from being able to bring it out there. And it, there always has been. Okay. Um, we are getting a few questions uh, in the chat. And since this is a fluid production, I'd like to ask a question that comes from Deborah Nichols. And when, and as I do this, I just want to, uh, Shout out Ohio University for making this possible for us today. Uh, and also thank the uh, NAACP. Uh, and specifically, I want to thank my sister because it was her suggestion that led to this happening. So um, 
My sister is a president down there and she is carrying on the legacy of my father, Robert J. Robinson Sr., who served in the capacity of president for 19 years. So I'm giving my sister big ups for the work that she's doing and, and thank to her, thanks to her for making the suggestion. Uh, Deborah asks, are young people afraid of becoming artists today, uh, possibly because of economic concerns or are they adapting artistically in new ways? I think it's both and, you know, when, when you get into the arts, so many people will try to talk you out of it. I, you know, my father and my mother, they both worked in factories for over 30 years. And when I came home from college talking about I wanted to write poetry. I was, I was, I wanted to be a writer, a, a poet. My father said to me, boy, can you make money with that shit? That's right. That's right. And, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. so all around you, people will try to talk you out of it. But I think for most of us, it's a calling. It's, it's yes. something that's born in us. Yes. It's something that we don't know how not to do it. And when I'm around young people in various schools of the arts, um, I see that same enthusiasm in them. And, and when they relate to us, it, it allows them to see that, yes, this is something that you can do. This is something that you can make a living at it. And, and we do it not because we get paid. That's right. We do it because it's what we have to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but at the same time, we like getting paid now. <laughs> because it is what we do. It's not a hobby. Okay. You know, we we've put a lot of effort and energy into working with our mentors and and, and each of us, we have mentors that we've worked with. Yes. We've studied our craft mm -hmm. and and we we work on it 24-7. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree with Okata about the both and, and I'm thinking about when I did do a lot of work in high schools, how often I would go into a classroom and I would say, how many of y'all write poetry? And all of these hands would go up and poems would start coming out of book bags and pockets. And the classroom teacher would be often be the most surprised because since she'd never asked that question, she was unaware of how many po people were writing poetry in her class. When I was coming up, same thing as Okanta. I don't know where I would be now had someone said to me, Poet, writing poetry and doing that kind of stuff, that's, that's nice for a hobby, but what are you going to do to make a living? When I got a job with Chevrolet Motor Division in their zone sales office, people always thought I worked in the factory, which is cool, but I never did. My family thought I had made it. Mm. And when I told <laughs> them 12 years and 11 months later that I was not taking the job transfer to Detroit, but taking the buyout to go back to school, everybody to a person thought I had lost my mind. Right. What they didn't realize though, was that that had been 12 years and 11 months of some of the most miserable times for my spirit in my life, mm. because I was doing nothing with the gifts that the creator had given me. And even though my next job was working for $6 and 50 cent an hour, I was so happy, I've never looked back. So there is mm. a both hand. And when I encounter young people who have talent, I encourage as many of them as possible to go for the art, find a way to make a living at what you love because I'm living proof. I was making my age at 32. That's supposed to be some sign of success. Money is man-made, is not everything, and it does not make the spirit happy. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I pick it back on the two doctors. Uh, um, I started. I did. I didn't know. I didn't know even though it's a hobby. I just loved what I was doing at the time in junior high school during the Cedar program back in the seventies in Houston uh, at this church summer camps. Uh, we were doing the Hobbit, and and during the summer we getting paid while learning what we love to do. But I saw it as a hobby. 
until I was about to graduate. Then my mentor who ended up recruiting me and a couple others from Houston to Prairie View, C. Lee Turner, he brought us, he came by with some applications. He said, look, you know, you want to see, you want to see this as a profession. I'm like, huh? Because no. my concern is I wanted to go to Hollywood. But mm -hmm. I just seen Pam Gray in a movie. You know, <laughs> I wanted to go to Hollywood. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be an actor after seeing Roots uh -huh. and seeing all these black folks on Roots and then seeing Pam Gray and Jim Brown and Fred Williamson being lucky with her. Mm -hmm. I want to be an actor. <laughs> so a uh, movie actor. So I was dreaming to go to Hollywood and not mm -hmm. even thinking about how much I'll get paid. Mm -hmm. um, finally, I was recruited to Prairie View. It was my first year of uh, this book, this acting book that went from Greek theater, from Roman theater, all the way up to the contemporary theater. I saw a picture of Ron O'Neill. Mm. Uh, it was one page, it had a picture of Ron O'Neill, and it says, I was saying it Karamu, because uh, I wasn't knowing how to spell Karamu at the time. <laughs> Actually, that's I found out later, that's the actual character. spelling. Karamu is the actual spelling I found out later, Karamu, mm. Karamu. But it says, Karamu House alumna, alumna, Ron O'Neill as Othello. And there was this mm -hmm. actress playing Desdemona sitting next to him. And I looked at the book. I was in my class. I said, oh, my teacher said, well, this, this guy's super fly. What is he doing a play? He's on a play? <laughs> <laughs> this guy playing super fly. He's yeah. super fly. What is he? And so... He's an actor. He was an actor first, Terrence, like that. Those remaining three years that caused me to get more serious and passionate in theater. He said, it's not about the pay. You have to learn to be passionate. It's not about the pay. It's about the passion. Mm -hmm. My mentor told us that the minute after that, graduating, going to New York, is learning and being around other people I learned about. because They're walking the streets. I recognize some of them of these legends. I mean, Arthur French, I got a chance. He was a co-member, co co-founding member of the Negro Ensemble. I'm like, Arthur French, <laughs> you know? And I'm sitting around these guys, learning more stuff between the, that's not even between the book, books, the pages of the books of acting, learning from them up in McDonald's with it's at 2 a.m. on 42nd Street, Talking about the arts, mm -hmm. you know. So after that, leaving from there, coming to uh, to Caramu, and everybody said, "Hey, hey, hey!" You know, I want you to mentor me. I want you to mentor me. I said, "The minute you want me to mentor you, two people came to Caramu one day. Said, I want you to mentor me. Somebody had just graduated from high school. They want to go to L.A. Get an agent. You get an agent for me. I'm like, I don't even know you. So I said, "Here's some books right here." I gave him a book on African American theater. I gave him a book on Amir Baraka. Mm -hmm. I said, read these first and then we'll talk. Mm -hmm. I did not see them again. Because mm -hmm. they didn't want to put the commitment in. They didn't want to put the commitment in. That's what a lot of them today are not, they don't want to put the commitment because I, I have a lot to do with some of the rap music and all that, which I love, but they see these young people making it like Tupac, you know, and all these other uh, um, rap stars in these movies and say, oh, I can do that. I can bypass and circumvent from training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you got to put the commitment in. Um, ever since George Floyd, though, I must say, there's been a plethora of expressions coming out. Mm -hmm. And I've seen young people now find, in social media to finding ways, rediscovering or discovering people like Toni Morrison, people like Alice Walker, Baraka, you know, they seen them on, and they say, oh, wow, I didn't know this person. I said, there's nothing new under the sun. That's right. So they're all discovering and rediscovering these people back in the day because I still think it's important that we can't bypass that. And let me just say, we one thing we need to talk about is BIPOC. Um, oh, Lord. BIPOC, Can we not the talk acronym, I love it. Uh, but in, 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 a, in terms of also black theaters, of black organizations versus the mainstream of white theaters. One thing that scared me right now, these programs that some of the artists I know are creating, these acronyms are turning into programs in white, in white organizations and they're getting money. Yes. When some of that money I wish could be also put into black, some seed money 
in building some black organization up, you know, uh, a, uh, a, a black theater or something like that, because they're still getting a piece of a pie. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's fair. So I just had to put that in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's important. I mean, it's like as artists and as cultural workers, we have to cultivate an appreciation of the arts. You know, Vince talked about artists being essential, but yes. culture is essential. And, you know, Harold Cruz wrote a book, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Yes. And, and one of the things he talked about is how the theater, mm -hmm. if we were to control the theater, that through the theater, it brings all of our professions together. Because you got to have writers, you got to have performers, you got to have the technical people, you got to have the people who promote it, you got to have the people who finance it. You know, all of that can come together in the arts, in the theater. Yes. And, but we have to cultivate that. We live in a society that really does not appreciate the arts and culture. It pays lip service to it. Yes. but it really does not appreciate it. It really does not invest in it. As soon as the budget is cut in the schools, the first thing, the first thing they go after are the arts. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I just want to say something about black culture and black arts and black people. It seems to mm -hmm. me that there's money for BIPOC. There's money for, mm -hmm other kinds of art done by other cultures, but there's something about black culture and black art that makes the powers that be afraid. And they would rather have it yes. be anything yes. but black because black connects us to the world. It connects us to the diaspora. It connects us to each other. And that's what I think, right. that's what I think the unspoken fear is grounded in. Well, you know, you yes, you you bring this up, and and brother Conte, you brought up the the book, the crisis of the Negro intellectual, and I'm often reminded of the impact that J. Edgar Hoover had hmm. on the social <laughs> justice civil rights movement, and the J. great threat. J. Edgar Hoover, yes to pseudo white supremacy, because I don't use the term white supremacy anymore, pseudo white supremacy. Mm -hmm. The greatest threat to pseudo white supremacy is Pan-Africanist intellectualism. And, it, and, it's, and it's really kind of frustrating sometimes because sometimes you'll do a production, Terrence, or you do a, a production, uh, Dr. Weems, and when you come in and you look at the audience, we ain't there. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and then when you look at who appreciates the work that we do, sometimes you see that as everybody but us. Mm -hmm. So talk about the disconnect <laughs> and, and talk about the importance of advancing African centered intellectualism as the uh, the the elixir or, you know, perhaps that thing which can resolve some of the discomfort that we have in our own being these mm -hmm. days. I think it starts with us taking control of the education of our own mm -hmm. and not counting on not counting on educational institutions that were established with the racist foundation to reinforce the conservative status quo to do it. When I think about the fact that right today Black studies courses and black studies um, um, African American history classes are still not a, a required part of the curriculum. And even to the extent you take those classes, that's only a small, small portion of the broader spectrum of history. I think encouraging our young people to learn, to get into these places called libraries, and books and film and learning about 
who we are, where we come from, and the real contributions we made to this country. For example, Rosa Parks wasn't, she wasn't physically tired. She was tired of racism. And she was yes. sitting in the black people section of the damn bus, encouraging <laughs> our kids to wrap themselves in the armor of who we are and stop counting on other folk to do it would be a great start. Well, that's what Cruz is saying is the crisis of the Negro intellectual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like the crisis is our own intellectuals do not appreciate uh, uh, the efficacy of uh, and the essential nature of our culture. It's like everybody else sees it. Our culture is making billions of dollars for everybody except us. us. Yes, and, yes. You know, we have to fix that. That's it. Have, and, and part of what Cruz is also talking about you know, so much energy is invested into one trying to be validated by the larger white society. Yes. Two, not only to be validated, but to be accepted into it. Yes. And acceptance is, is often uh, uh, the criteria for acceptance is to be accepted on their terms. Yes. Yes. You know, as opposed to creating something for ourselves. Yes. You know, people get upset with me. For example, I used to love to play baseball. I'm sitting here looking at a picture of Roberto Clemente, Willie Mays, and, and Hank Aaron. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. Three of my heroes growing up. But my father used to point out to me that people put all of this attention on Jackie Robinson. Yes. Integrated Major League Baseball. Nobody. Nobody really talks about Cecil black Cecil. people had a baseball league that we owned. We were the owners. We were the players. Yes. We were the managers. Mm -hmm. We were the general mm -hmm. managers. We we attracted so many people to the Negro League All-Star Games that they could lease a Comiskey Park. They yes. could lease a Yankee Stadium. So Ranch Ricky understood that all of these black folk are coming out here to see these games. If I have a player on my team, they'll come to my stadium and make me rich. Yes, that's right. Yep. And so we lost something and we didn't even lose it. We gave it up. Yes. It, yes. To become a part of something else. Yes. So that tension is still very much a part you know, when I have students who tell me they want to be teachers, I suggest to them that's fine, but you know, you need to think about creating a school. Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't come to me and complain to me about what you didn't get in your public school education. Yes. Because it's true. Mm -hmm. But how do we correct that? We have to create schools so that mm -hmm. we can determine the curriculum, so that we can determine the textbooks. You know, mm -hmm. when Catholic people create schools, nobody accuses them of anything. No. A lot of our young people go to Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. When you go to create a school, it's it's like you you you'd have thought, as my father would say, was who struck John, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you yeah, know. Well, remember, coming out of slavery, the first thing Black people did was create their own schools. Mm -hmm. Even though they had to pay, when they paid taxes, most of the taxes went to what white folks needed. They raised extra money in order to support their own schools. And as poor as those schools may have been, our kids were learning. And guess what? When the powers that be saw that the schools, we were becoming successful at educating our own children. They broke that shit up, made public education a requirement and took control of the education mm -hmm. of our children as best they could. As James Anderson writes in his book, The Education of Blacks in the South, we thought that it's something that had been denied us for so long 
was the number one thing we needed to get because if it wasn't important, why had so many white folks tried so hard to stop us from getting it? Right. Mm. That's amazing. I uh, uh, go ahead, Terrence. Yeah, I want to go to to what the, about the whole thing with seeing more the majority of the white audience because as opposed to black in the in the seats. Uh, I go back to the seventies of. There were more black theaters, uh, community and professionals yes. back in the 70s. And the Ford mm -hmm. Foundation, of course, had given money to Robert Hooks and, and Douglas Turner Ward, the Negro Ensemble Company. Mm -hmm. And they started producing some good works. They started producing their own playwrights, as Dr. Country was saying. They produced their own playwrights, they had their own actors. Steve Carter, Ed Bullens, um, um, J.E. Franklin, my theater mother. Uh, all of them went through that that whole that assembly line of black theater, and they were trained. And some of the works from the Negro Ensemble Company, we're talking about before theaters became regional per se. The term regional theater, a lord, legal residential theaters that you know, the Playhouse and Goodman yeah. Theater, and all of them before they were even a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Arena Stage of DC was the first regional theater that sent something to Broadway. It was a great white hole back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So That's the Negro Ensemble Company was producing and bringing a lot of people in. That was the Wiz on Broadway. That was the arms who shot the box of God. And that was, of course, uh, 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 Don't Bother That Can't Cope. Guess who were the ones that was pushing the audience who was filling those seats up? And guess who were the ones saved the Wiz? It was churches by the busloads. Yes, yes. Churches were the ones really the mm -hmm. impact of the audience at that time during the 70s. Mm -hmm. Black plays from like in Nirgon Summer Company was going to Broadway. Mm -hmm. The last black play to come from a black theater, you talk about this whole FUBU thing, yes. from a black theater, black cast, to win a Pulitzer Prize. That was 40 years. 39 years ago, a soldier's mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Directly from a black theater. After that, it's been more plays coming from the mainstream, which is okay. But it reminds me of black colleges back in the day when you have people like a Jerry Rice, Rice, a Walter Payton, who come from these black colleges. But the minute these other colleges see this high quality product, the minute you see the high quality of actors and playwrights, all these other theaters start breaking things down and making things like very difficult, as Dr. Weems said earlier, putting things in place like unions. And a lot of black theaters couldn't afford that. They yes, couldn't right. pass a, a fire code. Yes. So they broke a lot of them down. So a lot of black theaters went under. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it caused a lot of actors to start going to these mainstream theaters. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. on top of that, it broke down families. Because in terms of, because mm -hmm. some, we don't know how to go to, to a theater and be quiet. We're not, it's not there anymore. We're, That's we're the young, it's not there anymore. Families take their kids to see a play and to be inspired. It's not there anymore, yes. you mm -hmm. know? And to see us up there on the stage. Mm -hmm. So the whole breakdown has a lot to do with a lot of theaters. You can go around the corner and see a play in New York. Mm -hmm. You can't do that anymore. Negro Ensemble Company has gone down. It's coming back up now. New Federal Theater just in, uh, just celebrated its 50th anniversary. That's the only one still moving in New York. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's only one black theater in every city. And that makes a difference too. When you got five or six mainstays, mainstream theaters mm -hmm. in that city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what brings the audience in. The minute you see that and the churches too, bringing mm -hmm. them in, that makes a difference in terms of why is there less blacks mm -hmm. in the audience here. Mm -hmm. That that brings us That's back to mind. Cruz's point, you know. Here we are in the second decade of the 21st century. 21st century. Yes. We have people, we have millionaires. Yes, we do. Yes. We have entrepreneurs. Yep. And and Cruz's point is that they have a responsibility to support the arts and culture. Um, another thing that came to mind when Vince, you know, we talk about audiences. In my own career, sometimes I didn't get any kind of 
real attention from black folk until they saw me getting attention from white audiences. It's the truth. Yes. That's yeah, true. Yeah. That's and true. and, That's and true. when they saw me getting attention from white audiences yeah. that somehow said to black folk that I was safe, that yes. the things yeah. that I was talking about, if if white people were willing to pay me mm -hmm. and to bring me mm -hmm. so that they could hear me, then you know, that made me safe for black folk. And and so sometimes right. with the stuff we got to be strategic. You know, I say to my friend, uh, my students, you know, everybody black, not your friend, and everybody white, not the enemy. That's right. It's true. That's right. True. You know, right. there are some white people who have supported me over the years. Yes. Without that support, I would not have gotten to where I've managed to to get in this Absolutely world. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Right. It's true. Okay. It's true. It's true. It's true. I got to do a real quick commercial. Uh, we've, we've had a pretty consistent audience as we've been on, and uh, we were going to migrate over to Zoom for a Q&A. But uh, as opposed to going through that, I would like to invite anyone who has a question to just drop your question in the chat. You can drop your question in the chat on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll be able to get to those questions and ask the questions. We've been on for almost an hour and a half, and I don't want to Keep these folks too long, but I do definitely want to leverage this opportunity to give you a chance to ask questions if you might have them. Uh, and again, I have to shout out Ohio University Chillicothe for making this happen, and also the uh, Ross County chapter of the NAACP. I have another question from uh, Deborah Nichols. Uh, she wants to know what small regional campuses like OUC can do to encourage more students to take the artistic leap. Mm. Bring in artists to encourage them, to work with them and encourage them. Okay. Yeah, I I, I, I agree to just bring in artists to, to expose right. young people. Okay. Terrence, I see yeah, you. I agree. From you. Yes, I agree with that too. That's the, the main the main attraction to bring somebody in. They can also you know, relate to. Okay. And, you know, uh, Brother Oconto, we've had this conversation uh, a few times about how you're seeing kind of a, an easing back from Pan-African Studies and Black Studies departments uh, and universities and colleges across the country at a time where we probably need more of it than less of it. You know, I think, uh, you know, you being in the department that you're in, and, and having all kinds of students come into your classroom, getting an understanding of history that they haven't gotten before. Can you talk about the importance of this type of an education, not just for us, but for everyone? You know, and, and I'll say this, I'm fortunate to be at Kent State in the sense that we have a department, we have a whole building, we have a theater in the building, we have an mm -hmm. art gallery. You know, I remember when Terrence was here, we were in between full-time directors and and, yes. and and Terrence helped us keep our program happening. You know, Steve Harvey started here, Arsenio Hall, Bertice Berry. Um, because of the response to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, on our campus at least, you know, we have a new university president and the situation is causing people to see that Department of Pan-African Studies may be more relevant now than at any other time in our more than 50 year history on this campus. Mm -hmm. Because they're realizing that all of these questions that my white colleagues are beginning to ask, we've been providing this information all along and people have been ignoring it they've been marginalizing it mm -hmm. but now they see the need for it and so you know i was able to write our curriculum is playing itself out in the streets yes 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 okay mm -hmm. for people like us oh, what happened on january 6th wasn't a surprise you know we weren't surprised mm -hmm. when donald trump was elected you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like these things have been there all along. 
you know, right now they're talking about the Republicans and their relationship with the Proud Boys and all of that. If we're dealing with history, you go back during the Civil Rights Movement, the, the, the 60s, the 50s, the 40s. It was the Dixiecrats, yes. racist yes. Democrats out of yes. the South yes. who were in league with the Klan and the mm -hmm. white citizens councils. So these things are not new. Mm -hmm. And as artists, we've been calling it out, whether it's going back to Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, whether it's Still dealing with me. all of it. I mean, yes. exactly. And, and so the movement really got started for us in 1619 when our ancestors first placed their, sh their feet on these shores. Mm -hmm. And we've been dealing with it ever since. Mm -hmm. And I want to jump in and yeah. say in terms of Black studies, Pan-African studies, et cetera, departments in universities all over this country, funding has always been an issue. Mm -hmm. Always. Didn't just start. Always. Okay, so uh, Vince, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to jump on with Dr. Kantu when he mentioned about he brought it was a it was a wonderful experience. They brought me there to uh, Kent State, and I must say because he said earlier when somebody I think when they asked you to come, you made a comment. So you sure you want me here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you sure you want me to talk? <laughs> um, it kind of reminded me when when Pastor Coven brought me in uh, to to put this piece of my offer up at Olivet Baptist Church last year. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, look, I mean, what do you want? He said, go all the way, do what you can, put everything up there. Are you, can you do that? And then a, an assistant sitting next to me said, you sure you want Terrence to do this? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I go back to thinking when I, when I came in, the first play I put up there, uh, at Kent State was uh, John Henry Red was no niggas, no Jews, no dogs. That's mm -hmm. right. Yes, yes. And and, it, and and that was actual, and that's the title of the play. And they started putting flyers around. Mm -hmm. They put flyers around. I don't know if you remember this, Dr. Country. Some of the students oh, yeah. told me they thought it was an actual image of like right, no right. Jew, no niggas, no Jews, All no have dogs. Broke loose on campus. <laughs> it was, yeah, there was an article, an article in a Campus newspaper mentioned some about play starting something, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but for me, it's not about it's not it's not about that. It's just it's about uh, provoking and discussion, basically. Yes. Yes. That's what that's what it's about. Basically about. But also in relationship to your question, Vince. We have a new president. Our previous president actually said to us in the department meeting that the history of Pan-African studies on Kent State's campus, and that includes the history of Black United students, that our program has made it possible for all of the other area programs and centers on campus. So in other words, because Black studies, which evolved into Pan-African studies, there's now a women's center. Mm -hmm. There's now an LGBTQ huh. center. Yes, yes. There is now a, mm -hmm. a Jewish student center. Yes. You know, and, and there's now Latino studies on campus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so we have opened the door mm -hmm. for uh, a, a serious intellectual investigation of these experiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so mm -hmm. again, more relevant now than at any other time. And okay. that reminds me of how the black civil the civil black civil rights movement was the start of rights movements not only in this country but all over all over the world. Yes. LGBTQ, yes. Yes. women's rights, and etc. started with us. Okay. We have a question here uh, from YouTube. It's Cecilia Ivy, Artistic Chaos, and she asks, where do you think visual artists should put their work to bring eyes to their social justice artwork as most galleries are closed currently? Virtual. That's where everybody's going. Yeah, virtual. virtual yes. Get it out there. Yeah, virtual. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, virtual. All right. Yeah. Um. And we welcome any further questions. We're gonna we're gonna kind of wind down because uh, Dr. Weems I know has to go, and uh, some of us have some other 
appointments that we have to make today. Yeah, I'm um, a senior citizen. I missed my nap. I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some, sometimes we have to go without, you know, and as being one of those who spends most days at home alone, <laughs> when I couldn't take that two thirty nap, sometimes folks don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always wonderful to uh, to have that opportunity. Uh, and I, I got to do a further commercial. Uh, we're down to around eleven or so. But um, if you like what you saw today, please go to the YouTube channel, like and subscribe to get further notifications. We we put up a lot of content as we can. Uh, I'm following Brother Terrence's footsteps. I'm embarking upon a filmmaker's career as well. Uh, my brother Okanta, uh -huh. he inspired me to do this a few years ago when he took the photographs and video that I shot over in Ghana and he went to iMovie and he put up two or three films that are on YouTube right oh, yeah, now. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, it's reinvention time uh, and it's time to move on to new ways to share work and, and to, to piggyback yes. also on what Terrence has done you know, I'm also in the process of putting together a film that will be from still images rather than video. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a chapter wow. from your photographer's All right. from her book. All right. And and getting some of my All work right. out. But um I have to tell you that this has really been a great conversation, a great discussion today. I'm gonna give folks a few more moments to ask any questions that they might have but I would be remiss if I didn't give all of you an opportunity to talk about things that you have currently in the works and to do all the shout outs that you need to do about uh, your artistic journey as it stands right now. So uh, Professor Okanta, I'm gonna go to you and have you go first. Um, and before I do that, in response to the last question about their work, you know, you young people in this time have the advantage of these various social media platforms. So to me, you need to do your homework. You need to find a mentor, uh, 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 work on your craft because you can now put your information out there. You can put your art out there. But, you know, you have to be careful because you only get one chance to make a first impression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great but advice. In terms of my own work, uh, I'm working on a book. It's called The View from Stono. Mm -hmm. uh, reflections, Reminiscences, and Ruminations. Um, it's, it's a book of commentaries and, and essays uh, from my research when I was going through the uh, tenuring process. But, you know, I also realized that everyone doesn't read poetry and there are things that I, I, I feel compelled to say that I can't necessarily say in poetry. And so I had to uh, expand my own writing and 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 start to deal with prose. Uh, I'm also working on a book project from interviews that I've done when I used to be on the radio uh, and bring that to people. And, you know, um, I had one piece, an epic poem that I wrote that was produced for the theater. And I would love to get back at that uh, so maybe I have to talk to you about that, Terrence. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Vince has actually composed some music for it. Vince and and Terrence, I think you know uh, Ismail mm -hmm. Douglas, uh, who yes. also composed yes. some music for it. And it was you mentioned the New Federal Theater years ago uh, when I was commissioned to write this piece. It was Woody King who talked to me about. Yes taking it to the theater. And what he said to me was, you concentrate on writing it, then find a theater person and get out of their way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. All right. How about you, Mary? So I was yes, just uh, in the African American Review for the second time in my career, a poem that I wrote about my husband, right. Love. 
in the fall 2020 issue. I'm a member of Obama's Playwrights Gym. And on March the Sunday, March the 7th, beginning at seven o'clock, it'll be live streamed and Zoomed, a piece called Intervals. Intervals is a series of monologues by myself and my other gym mates. You have to register for it. You can either go to the Dovbama face page, my website, www.maryeweems.org. And the monologue that I have in the piece is called Primary Care. It's about a COVID-19 nurse in a COVID ward directed by Christopher Johnson and starring Christine Howie. And the last thing I wanna mention is, I'm also working on the next book with my colleague, Brian Alexander, and it will be about spirit writing. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right, Terrence. All right. Uh, yes, um, one project, well, there's two, but one of them, I'm not the writer, but there's a book coming out soon, another year, that's been in the making for two, three years. Uh, this lady had, um, author had gotten in touch with me uh, based on some reference of stuff. I forgot the gentleman's name who lives here in Cleveland. Uh, she's writing a book on four black theaters uh, throughout the country. She wrote a book years ago in a penumbra theater in Minneapolis. Mm. So she uh, she got in touch with me and um, and I'm one of the four of, because I was artistic director of Caramel. So this book is gonna deal with these four black specific theaters including Caramel. So they interviewed me uh, during my time of it, Caramel and pictures and the struggles and the successes and everything. So that's going to be coming out by next year on this book. It's going to be used in schools and, and in the libraries and stuff like that. Um, after that, right now, also I'm in the making of, of sep as a matter of fact, I think September of, of this, this uh, 2021, uh, I've been asked to direct a piece called Live at Ferguson, uh, part of this, this uh, festival called Broadway Bound Theater Fest off Broadway uh, in New York. And that's set for September. And so it was pushed back. This is about the fourth time. So hopefully uh, I'll be using, they want me to use New York actors. I'm hoping to use some actors here too to be part of the play. Uh, but uh, it's a very exciting piece uh, called Live at Ferguson, Ferguson exclamation point. And it's going to be at Broadway, uh, 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 a Bound Theater Fest in New York. Uh, I just want to say, I want to honor uh, right now, because uh, I know we got to go, I want to honor those mentors of mine who have gone, who passed away. Uh, Celie Turner, Prairie View, who passed away a month ago. Uh, um, uh, Ted Shine, prolific playwright, his works with Dunning Negro Ensemble. He was the dean of theater, Prairie View. Uh, um, uh, Camille Billups, the well-respected visual artist, documentary filmmaker, and Jim Hatch, and also Owen Dotson, the famous poet, oh, wow. who, was a, who, who wrote the book, who I got a chance to meet, but who also wrote the book, Powerful Long Ladder, mm -hmm. in the, back in the 1940s, that my theater company is named after. Mm -hmm. It's named after his book, Powerful Long Ladder. So I just want to give a shout out to them and my family and friends back home in Texas right now. Okay. Can I have one more thing? Heaven. Yes. Can I add one more thing, Vince? Mm -hmm. Okay. My piece, Black Woman Gets Slapped in an Elevator, is a finalist for the Downtown Urban Arts Festival in New York. I was interviewed by Reg E. Gaines and the coordinator on, on um, February the 11th. Please keep your fingers crossed that the, my, I, my piece is selected for a full production. Yes. In April. Wonderful, wonderful. And one last yeah. shout out to Vince. Vince and I performed together. And, and so another project <laughs> is for us to finally get into a studio so we can record what we do. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right, all right. All right, well, my brother, I was in a recording Vince. studio last <laughs> Friday and I spoke to a young lady who was very capable of recording us. So I, I think I need to drag that uh, Nord Stage 2 keyboard in there <laughs> so that we can do what we do. Yes. Um, Brother Terrence uh, spoke of his mentors, and I would be remiss if I didn't recognize two giants from Kent State University. Mm -hmm. 
That will be Dr. Edward W. Crosby, who has transitioned, and Dr. E. Timothy Moore, who transitioned a week before he did. Uh, they're going to have services for both of them this week, and I think uh, we'll be involved on one level or another. I, mm -hmm. I'll be doing a virtual recording of Lift Every Voice and Sing from the studio. But uh, I just wanted to take this time to to honor and recognize those two giants. You know, uh, Dr. Crosby's son, Kofi Kemet, has given credit to Dr. Crosby and others at Kent State University for birthing Black History Month. It started uh, with Carter G. Woodson, but um, it actually evolved from a week to a month. And students on the campus of Kent State University had a voice and they had a they had a role in that. So I want to acknowledge them and their interaction with Dr. Crosby and others at the university, uh, including the president of the university at that time for making that happen. Uh, Dr. Moore is someone who opened my eyes to uh, photography. I took my first and only class that had anything to do with photography when I was a student in his class at Kent State University. So I just want to big ups him. And, you know, um, I actually named his daughter Candace. I don't oh, know why, wow. but for some reason I just had this name in my head. And so when I talked to him the next day and he told me that his daughter's name would be Candace, I knew where it came from. So we, we had a bit of a cosmic connection. Uh, at this point, I also want to once again thank Ohio University uh, Chillicothe for making this happen and uh, the, the Ross County uh, NAACP. This was a very uh, significant thing for them. They wanted to do some outreach. They wanted to make it relevant. And they, uh, they, they made contact with me and I made contact with three very reputable, credible people to bring what we brought today. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining me. I hope that everybody had their answers to the questions that they had in their mind. I'm sure you gave them much food for thought. And with oh, that, gosh. any parting words from, from anyone on the panel? I just thank love y'all, you, you. miss y'all. Only thing that would've made this better, yes. to do it in person. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Bring, it, bring, bring right. us back when it's safe. Right, that's right, yes. right, right, right. <laughs> Y'all take care now. Okay, peace and blessings, right. everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, take right. care. Bye-bye.